thank you. Um, I find it very hard to, um, to provide a, a proper discussion on the, on the report as a whole. Um, there's an awful lot in it, and I suppose if I, uh, if I had one wish is that you would have had another six months and cutting this now in 55 different, different pieces, mm -hmm. um, maybe not trying to bring them all together in the way it was done, but actually each piece on its own actually has some quite interesting things to say and to actually focus, our, um, focus us more on specific points where either in terms of thinking or in terms of policy making, we could, could learn a little bit. And it's a little bit reflecting, of course, you know, the world is a risky place, you know. Everything is risky. Uh, anything we do in development is risky. It's a messy place as well. Messiness often gets confused with riskiness, and as a result, everything is, is there. And of course, there's a huge amount of things that you can write about. And, uh, you know, if I, if I give one critical comment is that the report tries to write about too many things. But it doesn't mean that so that's an issue. I think it's actually what happens now next with it is then more important. And uh, I hope the bank has still time and energy, uh, including the team, to actually start cutting this into things, you know, on specific items, actually get them, bring the messages home. Because I fear that uh, if even discussions don't manage to get to the end, <laughs> <laughs> then you wonder how many people will get to come to the end. You know, this is... It's, it's for me, it's an ongoing criticism, not just of this report. Uh, you know, when we make flagship reports, uh, summaries don't do full credit to the richness of something. So you would rather have about 20 or 30 summary statements, three pages, that each of them clearly answer a question and keep on cross-cutting and so on. But anyway, we, that's um, not necessarily um, on the cards. And uh, of course, I had the, pr the, the, the privilege of, of engaging with the team throughout some of the work they've been doing. Um, I have spent some of my research career working on some of these issues, and I don't blame them at all that they don't necessarily go for, for my ways of framing some of the questions. But I want to highlight three things, <coughs> talk about three things that I think, and I, and I would say the report touched upon it. I just want to see, to, to actually suggest, you know, maybe these are some of the more essential bits that come out that I like about it and that maybe are worth taking away from it. So the first thing is, you know, um, I do like the fact that the report talks about risks and opportunities. It has it in the title. It brings it, well, quite nicely uh, home that, you know, trade-offs are, you know, just the bread and butter of life, the bread and butter of development, and that we need to come. And I'll come to that in a moment. But of course, on the risk side, we rarely complain about upside risk kind of like it, isn't it? You know, once in a while, you can only, if you can only win once in a while, and otherwise it's quite normal, that's quite a quite good life. So downside risk is, is the one that we're deeply concern about, concerned about. And I think already a bit what Alison also was implying on one point is that, you know, the, the space at which, in which risks can occur is so vast. Um, Donald Rumsfeld, not my favorite politician, but still he put it nicely <coughs> to talking about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And clearly, in the kind of policy making space, these require quite different things. You know, the known unknowns, and I think uh, most of the report seems to be touching upon the known unknowns, uh, which are, you know, where the risk distributions can be parametrized, we can think about them, we can bring them in, we can do very, very explicit rational decision making tools about it. Um, and we can we can can work around them. Um, um, unknown unknowns are things you know we may have to do risk management. Things we have no idea of the kind of risk that may actually occur, and we need to have responses. So that's that's the thing. But still, you know, these are the both things uh, that that may well well happen. Now, why do we care about them? Well, because downside risks, really bad things, they tend to destroy lives one way or another. Destroy your assets. Destroy your human capital. Li your lives, your livelihood, but also it forces us to change our behaviors. The possibility of these things occurring make us do things, certain things, in, sp in terms of not being able to take up opportunities. And so the trade-off is there, they're very, very much important. Now, for me, the key thing what follows from this, and then, you know, if you do look at all the research papers that have been done about it, is that ultimately what, what, what because the downside risk is there, the fundamental policy response is, 
is always going to be somewhere or another creating flaws of certainty. Somehow providing some kind of flaws of certainty. It doesn't have to be deterministic exact, but what I mean by it is, you know, you, um, if you have enough wealth, you can actually deal with an awful lot of stuff. If you have reasonably good institutions around you, in maybe in the Northian definition, you know, values, behaviors, norms there that people will support you, or indeed in the organizational sense, systems that are there, someone that will pick you up, or indeed if you have a state that can offer it, that's, that's clearly, this provides you with this ab ability to, to actually not to have to worry too much about it. Things will still happen, stuff will happen, but you, you, you can kind of deal with it. You can get on with your life. If you don't have that, and I think that's the other side, and I wish the report had talked a little bit more about it, then we get when we do also, for example, more qualitative work in developing countries, how people tell about their lives being blighted by these kind of bad things that happened. Mm -hmm. the, but the cumulative <coughs> vicious circles of them all re le reaching to kind of hopelessness and kind of the inability to actually organize people's lives. Mm -hmm. But against it, creating some flaws of certainty is clearly something that you, uh, that, 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 that you want. But the important thing is, and that is actually, I disagree with Alison here, there is an element in terms of maybe, even though they're platitudes, the elements for public, uh, public policy. It is worthwhile to remember that you know, every country will claim to have a policy towards dealing with risks and dealing with disasters and disaster responses and so on. The key for people is that they're credible, that indeed the assistance will come. Not just because then they won't suffer when something bad happens, but they're not forced in their behaviors to all the time having themselves organized as well. And I think these behavioral responses are quite important. So credibility is something <coughs> important. The predictability, the credibility of what is there in your society. And I think that's important because the key is there that maybe you won't lose everything, there won't be any of this destruction, but you can also start changing your behavior. And then actually opportunities can be grasped because then I think that's quite important. I think if there's, um, th there's more work to be done on this, but you know, people often talk about this risk management or finding ways of dealing with risk that good for growth and all these kind of things. Well, you know, if there's any ever a mechanism, it's going to be there. Is that actually there is some kind of flaws of certainty that get created so that actually people can be an entrepreneur, they can start doing things. You know, <coughs> if I fail in the UK as an entrepreneur, there is income support. If I fail as an entrepreneur in, a, <coughs> in, a, in Ethiopia, there is destitution. So there is the kind of element that you want to have. So, and I think it's in the report, and I'm, this is actually not a criticism, and I find it like mm -hmm. the central part on, 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 the, on the risk management and the government responses. It's about credibility, creating that sense of hopelessness, sorry, creating that sense of certainty so that hopelessness then doesn't have to follow. Second point I want to make is that, and that's not just anything to do with the report, and in fact the report does some interesting things here and there, uh, but it's definitely in the literature on, 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 uh, on risk first opportunity, on the kind of, you know, analyzing all the risks that people are facing, seeing what it means for their, their responses, and then coming up with the policy recommendations around it. And I'm now going to go after a little bit some of the work that people do around resilience, okay? And I do feel, I'm quite happy that you didn't emphasize it too much, but I do know also that, you know, you want to be a bit more careful and I'm get, going to get in trouble. Uh, the problem with thinking that focuses too much on resilience. And the point is, is actually what the report nicely <coughs> does. Because risk and opportunities are important trade-offs. But also the responses towards risk may not necessarily be trying to do something about the second moment of the distribution, i.e. the variance, keeping the risks down, but it may be about creating new opportunities. And let me give a very concrete example. I was just reminded over, the, over, over lunch briefly of, a, of work that I've been involved in, but I find very striking. In economics, in our cultural economics research, there's one data set that virtually anyone that now, that now is in their 50s and is a development economist in the US will have written a chapter on in their PhD, which is the Indian ICRISAT data set, 240 poor, very poor in all meanings of the word, uh, villages in, uh, in India, in three villages in India, or, um, or sorry, six villages in India in three districts. Uh, it has produced something like, I think, uh, 300 peer-reviewed journal articles, of which an awful lot were about risk. 
because you know this is a panel data set. They followed between 75 and 84 these people, and they documented all the bad things that happened. Virtually every stylized fact that occurred in development economics and to fairly recently, or the whole textbook of Deborah Trey is basically informed by these 240 southern Indian villages. Now, what do we find there? So there's whole research and a lot to do with risk coping, risk sharing. In fact, a lot of the research I've been doing I was all inspired by all this kind of research on how to deal with risk about drought insurance, about finding other ways of insurance, about how credit markets can help you with insurance, and you name it, it was researched. Anything to do with risk was there. Uh, I was involved in a study where we went back to all these villages, and anyone who was still alive who was interviewed by these people, and we did that five years ago, we tried to find them back. We found them, 81% uh, of the people we found back, uh, of those surviving, and all, well, most of the poor people that have managed to move up in the world, they did it through migration. They just didn't try to survive in a drought-resist, drought-prone area, trying to do drought-prone agriculture with all the kind of resilient ways of doing farming and uh, or via local insurance markets, all the thing. They did it something quite dramatic. They gra grasped the opportunities of development. They got, they got rid out of risk. Of course, the report does this a bit in its, in its bit of the work on, on labor markets and so on. But it's the key thing, you know, for most people, Getting rid of, of our risk-prone life is just getting a job. That's how development happened in the UK. That's how we don't need to talk about any more resilience uh, all the time for everybody around us. But we actually talk, uh, talk much more about, you know, is job creation is the things. Development is the most powerful part of resilience. And we have to be very careful not to focus on second moments of distributions. But keep an eye that the most powerful way to get rid of a risk-prone life may well be to try to get out of it. Okay, so, you know, and risk management must, must not stifle these opportunities. The report, again, I'm not going to accuse it at all. It mentions it, uh, but you want to keep on emphasizing it that in, in the policy when we do risk management. That term already suggests we're going to manage the risks and not the opportunities. We're not going to do trade-offs. Uh, of course, we should do it, and the resilience works sometimes as well. So a final point. So um, having, you know, actually... I had to hear my notes. I was going to compliment them again on their <laughs> public policy <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> At least if we understood them well. And I think in the risk space, people hadn't quite done it. You know, it's, it's, it's about predictable frameworks and certainty and not more uncertainty, but also keeping in mind that you don't want to remove all risks, uh, but also don't be obsessed by removing the risks in the people's livelihoods. This may actually be about alternative livelihoods and opportunities that development can offer. The best predictor of resilience is development. If you do it in cross-country regressions, you'll see that actually GDP per capita is the best predictor. I'm not trying to s minimize it to that, but let's not forget that. Don't look just at that. But then the final thing is about more in the face, something I see every day in my job in DFID. And that's basically, in the face of a lot of risks, we need to do risk management, whether it's risk management of our own processes or risk management <coughs> and development. Um, it's the public policy angle and all the kind of problems we have. And actually, I have in mind disaster risk management, but if you want to think about corruption controls in your systems, you could just about think about, that, about it in the same way. And this is something, and I'm going to make a link, not necessarily that you will be pleased with it, but the next WDR, where I'll probably be discussing next year around the same time, <laughs> is about behavioral economics. And actually, I do think that when we're designing uh, risk management policies, it's probably very useful to learn, to, to take, take note of a couple of things from decision science, from, deci from experimental psychology and behavioral economics, to actually keep in mind a couple of things. And I just mention a few things that I see every day and that I think in the whole disaster risk management area is really crucial. It's um, the biases we keep on getting. So what we talk about is that so clever, intelligent, well-intentioned, good managers tend to make these errors in their judgments. And these judgments are very well known in human behavior across the world, in across organizations. So the first one would be hindsight bias. Mm -hmm. And what is hindsight bias? Is that you, the, the very general statement that people like to say is that uh, once something, something happens, you, don't, you can't imagine anymore a world it hadn't happened before. You can't imagine the, the, the world anymore that it, as it was before it. Put it very simply, what people find in experiments is that if something happens, something bad or good happens, you will, you will respond to that much more than something that you knew well before, something bad, for example, that happened a long time ago. So think about it. Suppose there is somewhere 
a, um, you know, a typhoon or something is happening, and suddenly you, you respond in your entire process and you say, well, surely our processes have to be really be perfect to respond to a typhoon in a, in a, in a, in a country that consists entirely of islands. Surely our resources must flow to be prepared in the future for that kind of disaster. And as a result, you actually say, well, I, you're not going to go back to what you knew before, what the risks of that kind of disaster happened, for example, with a massive drought in Africa, but you will actually think that's the one that needs to do. But of course, in risk management, we make choices all the time. Uh, you have to make choices. Now you're going to make the choice relative to the event that has just happened. You're going to make your process entirely proof to that kind of process, to make sure that that thing can work well. And meanwhile, you will start cutting on things that may well have equal or higher probability to happen in the world as a disaster. Of course, think of it in your own organizations. If you suddenly have, imagine if it's suddenly a corruption scandal of a particular type, you're going to get all your system changed immediately to be able to handle that one. But actually, the real risks, you're not even thinking about it. That's hindsight bias. Very important in risk management, we're getting our systems wrong because we keep on responding to what happened yesterday. We do this in public policy on child protection, on anything you can imagine in public policy. In fact, we do this all the time. So that's one. And the second one is procrastination. Again, in disaster risk ma management, in fact, the technical term I want to use is Bayesian conservatism linked with confirmation bias. Oh gosh, what nice terms. So Bayesian conservatism is basically meaning some new information about risks emerges and you kind of don't really want to process it. So something is happening. Say, suppose you get early warning system reports, something is happening, <coughs> but you somehow say, look, in that part of the world, nothing is really happening. So you don't really process that information and you're not going to add it into your prediction. So you see weather reports, uh, you know there's a drought occurring in Somalia, but actually you're going to wait for quite a while until it really starts visible. You're not really going to say, surely it is not going to happen. You're not really processing the new information as if they add something to your model in terms of how you predict. And it leads to procrastination. So it's a very clear thing that we get in disaster risk management as well. Again, not really responding properly. So that's an example here, and, and the report touches upon it here and there. But it's where you need rules, where you need lock-in, where you need checklists, where you say, you know, look, I'm going to try to avoid these biases in public policy making that I'm actually going to respond and as objective as I can. So for example, one thing I, I'm quite in favor of is that in disaster risk responses, from the moment forecasts start saying there is a risk that something is happening, you do a little bit like a rocket launch. You start at 100 and you're counting down. And what you need to do is stop the process, but the process is ongoing. And so you're building processes where you have to act to stop something rather than act to start something. And I think that would be quite a useful thing in humanitarian assistance things. I talked enough. Thank you. But fascinating stuff and many thanks. I